Welcome to Inside the She Cave, Trailblazers, Innovators, and Rule Breakers. I'm your host, Cindy Glansrock. On today's episode, enjoy a visual journey through the lens of the landscape painter and artist, April Gornick. We experience and explore her interplay of light and darkness and how this translates into a profound connection to nature and nurture, all part of her intricate process. April reflects on her 40 years and the changes in her style. A transition from hard edge abstractions and conceptual art to painting open landscapes, inspired by photos, memories, and dreams. April shares a childhood poignant memory on Lake Erie with her father. These subtle references are part of the fabric of her creations. Her landscapes transform into this poetic expression, which includes the challenges and surprises that shape her process. April's ability to bend light physically with a brush and mentally with her philosophy are a testament to her vision and the power of art to move us on a soulful journey. Besides working as an artist, April's local passion projects are many. At the top of the list is both the preservation and redevelopment of the old Sag Harbor movie theater and the church in Sag Harbor, which is a deconsecrated 19th century Methodist church, which April and her husband, artist Eric Fischel, purchased, gutted, and redesigned with the support of the local Sag Harbor community. The church hosts cultural and art exhibitions, printmaking classes, concerts, and ongoing collaborations. In addition to supporting the Sag Harbor Partnership, which is a nonprofit entity, they were able to purchase the home of author John Steinbeck and turn it into a writer's residency retreat. So let's not delay our conversation inside the She Cave with this true force of nature, April Gornick. I am so delighted, and delighted means because you are a delightful person, April Gornick, um, to be here with you. You know, some people bring great light into life. And you, even though some of your paintings have darkness in them, you as a person bring this great light to so many people, definitely to the town of Sag Harbor, which has been a part of my life for a very long time. And I think Sag Harbor is a new place because of you, April Gornick. And that means that the light, the vision, the creativity, the preservation, and the beauty, hats off to you. Thank you, Cindy. That's incredibly nice of you to say. I... I've been very, very gratified at the way that people have responded to both the cinema and the church and Steinbeck House and all of the stuff that I've been involved in, and it's been a pleasure to do it. And by this and is, large. By and large, it's always going to be by and large, but it's more a large, a largesse as far as I'm concerned, considering we have one of your beautiful paintings behind you and you have a wonderful exhibition at the uh, Miles McHenry Gallery until October 21st, which I was so fortunate to hear you speak yesterday after just returning a few days from Paris, jet lagged and all. What is it about your connection to your paintings, community, the earth, the planet, landscapes, that kind of makes you such a visionary, but such a soulful individual? I mean, did that were you just born that way? I have a huge worry gene somewhere in my DNA and I worry about everything constantly and the planet is something I've been worrying about forever I mean since you know the the early 70s when people were talking about running out of oil and etc cetera, etc cetera. but not in the way that I feel now when we're facing a, a legitimate existential crisis it's become so much more and there's because I love the outside world, because I love animals, because I love wildness and wilderness and the untamed world, I've had a lot of concern about the environment, just kind of naturally from being a child, really. So it's it's a very long relationship. And when I first started painting landscapes, I really wasn't thinking of them as having some sort of, or meaning to have an ecological awareness impact. But People have been asking me about that since I've been doing landscapes, maybe partly because they don't take landscape as subject matter that doesn't need some sort of utility. But, I mean, my basic impulse in making landscapes has been to express something that's deep within myself, that's spiritual, that's very complicated, and that has a lot to do with mortality and the soul and et cetera, et cetera. So, but 
At this point, although I always honestly admit to people that that's how I began them without thinking I was going to make a statement about the world and the mess climate and the environment is in, which, by the way, it's sort of interesting that we we divide ourselves between ourselves and the environment. We're not apart from it. The fact that now if someone looks at my work and sees beauty in wildness and something that's untouched by human interference, then I'm, I'm encouraged if they, if they think, if they get a shock of a sense of it being precious and want to preserve it, yay. You know, so that's, yay. that's a great effect. Well, it's interesting, reading back when you talked about I am an artist that values, sort of quoting you, hopefully not misquoting you, above all the ability of art to move yeah. you emotionally and physically and make art that makes you question and that derives its power from being vulnerable, a vulnerable interpretation that is intuitive and beautiful. There was a quote that says, nature is everything I am not, the ultimate other. And that was before mm-hmm. your exhibition now in Chelsea, which is called The Other Side. And I thought that mm-hmm. was so interesting. So the other to you, I guess, is what? Nature? Is it's, it's the unknown? Everything else. I, mean, and, I mean, to be really specific, it's everything outside of myself. It's, it's imagined objectivity, which is imagined because I, people are subjective. This could be a very complicated um, conversation. Yeah, we're going but, into philosophy now. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing that I that I understood early on about, I mean, early on, it was a long time ago, but it took me years to get to this place. When I first started doing landscapes, I wanted to have an excuse and a rationale and a, a, a somewhat intellectual explanation about why making landscapes when I first started to make them in the very late 70s, like in 79, was justifiable in terms of the contemporary art world and art history and et cetera. And I went to elaborate lengths to to kind of posit what I was doing as having a place in art. But then that, you know, that I was coming from a very intellectual kind of uh, crutch for, for working and for and feeling secure. And the desire for security led me to try to over-intellectualize what I was doing, and I finally gave up. I mean, it, it helped me that people would see the work in very different ways. Like one person would look at something and think it was ominous and scary, and other person would look at it and think that it was healing and grounding and peaceful. And I'd think, how can this be that one thing could generate all these different responses? And then I eventually realized, I don't know how many years into doing this, that great art is vulnerable to interpretation. That's one of its hallmarks, I think, is that you don't ever quite get to the bottom of what it means. And what it means is just, besides being narrative, which landscape is not, it's also um, constricting, I think, in terms of a kind of a spiritual slash emotional response, which is not not separated from the intellect. They're not yes. separate, but you know, we tend to, we tend to quantify and file things in different categories so that we can manage them. And art is, art is messy. I, you know, making a painting is a lot of chaos. And then when you kind of get it to all behave synchronously in some ways, as I do in my work, then I'm hoping that it will elicit responses that do generate very, very different reactions in different people. And I've come not only to be happy about that, I think that it's kind of the whole crux of what I'm doing. But again, it took me a really long time to realize that. So when I'm talking about my work, it's after like now almost 40 years or something of making landscapes, meditating on them, trying to, and it's, when I say landscape, I mean, it's, they're landscapes, but it's, it's about light, light and darkness. It's about mortality. It's about, it's about a certain kind of um, gravity that we all live with and the loosening or the lightening up of that and, and those things in combination. But it's often about your, to me, you're about light, no matter whether it's dark or light, light. <laughs> I mean, you bending yeah. the light, you know, I love that piece that you have at the, because at, the expression bending the light to me is what you do. You almost manipulated. I know you, you talk about your process, which I'd love the audience oh, that, to hear that, about. 
actually that painting is called Light Bending the World. So it's the light that's actually. <laughs> okay, the light's bending the world, but you are yeah. controlling the environment that's in that painting, yeah. right? Yes, of and, course. And, and the right. light's bending the world, but you're bending the light in order for the light to bend the world for us to appreciate. Yeah. So you make the paintings relatable. And I didn't realize the breakdown of your process, whether it's your own Photoshop and photographs and then looking and then painting and then layering. And it's just such an intric intricate process that you go mm -hmm. through. Every moment of it, it's a like a give and take when you seem to be working on your paintings. Yeah, well, I mean, to, to just make the long process story short, it, yes. it happens that usually when I decide to paint something, it's because I... I get a little, and this is very physical, and that's why I talk about corporality with the work, because I hope that people feel like a, sometimes a sense of humidity, sometimes a sense of lightening, sometimes a, a sense of being weighted. Um, I want the paintings to come into the viewer's consciousness and to elicit those things. But when I'm deciding to paint something, it's usually because I've seen something that I I get a little shock of familiarity from it. It almost feels like I, I know that, I know that place, which means that I'm locating myself in it somewhere or somehow. And so deciding how to try to convey that as a work of art is the, is the impetus. And then the, the actual physical process for making the paintings involves working out an image and oftentimes it's with photographs that I've taken, sometimes collaging photographs that I've taken, reaching into source material from dreams, memories, books I've read, poems, music I listen to, a lot of source material, art history, and then starting to put the image together. I have found that I've worked out an elaborate process of I think you could fairly call it a kind of mild self-sabotage where I start with the right proportion of canvas, but then I make myself draw it out by hand. I don't use a projector. And then I add the underpainting, which is usually contrasting, somewhat contrasting colors, but there's not a rule for it. It's just like an intuitive thing mm -hmm. that I decide that certain colors will give um, a kind of dimensionality to the surface of the painting once it's done. So choosing colors, painting that in, starting to feel out the way that the painting might have areas of tension and release as I work with it, and then we'll be able to develop because of the way that I underpainted, and then starting to put more like final colors or intended colors on it, and then not ever making enough and always getting it a little bit wrong when I'm working on my palette to just mix up some colors that I think will work and then having to add to them and change them. So there's like all these things that sort of like trip me up and expand the way that I involve myself in the, the object that I'm trying to make. And then finally, once the painting has started to to be realized, they're almost invariably something that I didn't quite anticipate, that there are certain significant like nature. changes. <laughs> yeah, like nature, like life. Like you life. Know? Again, yeah. why separate them? I don't know if you struggled with becoming a landscape oh. painter. At, at oh, my God. No, completely. Because when I moved to New York, I I thought, like, I can't paint landscapes. I live in New York. I have to be, like... A, look like a contemporary paint. And I, I actually started painting interiors. I, I don't always mention this, but I, I went through uh, several months where I was making these weird little interior paintings. Still didn't have people in them, but they were like interiors and floors and walls, and there were tracks running in them and things like that. And I was feeling more and more nauseous. I was not <laughs> feeling connected to myself. And I thought, oh, I'm going to have to go back to landscape painting and, you know, damn the criticisms and that would ensue and stuff. And then, as I think you heard me say the other day, I actually would be approached by people who would be drawn to the paintings. And I think that they're drawn to the paintings the same way that I, that I more obviously encourage people 
to enter them and, and experience them, they'd be drawn maybe by the, the mystery or the beauty or the whatever. I mean, I, I painted very awkwardly at the beginning. There's, it's been a long time to like work out the way I paint now. But I would have people say to me generously, I think on their part, oh, so you're making ironic landscape paintings that address the history of landscape art and as if it were like some sort of art historical commentary that I was making instead of an expression of myself. Right, right. My deepest, you know, kind well, of... Well, I loved reading sense. about how you would go to, was it Lake Erie um, with your father? Was oh, it? man. Yeah, that was, well, that was something I did as a kid. My, my well, dad That's was, an interesting memory. You were speaking of memories before, you know? Um, yeah, and that I, was... I, I, felt, I felt the memory when you described it. Mm, yeah, my, my dad... We would go for usually for one week to a place called Madison on the Lake to vacation. We didn't do this, you know, regularly through my whole childhood, but in my teen years before my dad died, he died when I was 16. In my early teen years, we would go down to the lake and it's, you know, it can be very flat. It also is the most treacherous of the great lakes because it's shallow. So mm -hmm. when storms kick up, you get really ferocious storms. But we'd go down to the lake and he, he had swum since he was a kid, and he grew up on the shore of the lake in impoverished circumstances, but he was a really good swimmer. So he'd just, like, take off. Amazing. And I'd look at the horizon line and his disappearing form, and i just think, oh, my God, this is what death is like. Yeah. I, I did. I just, it used to scare the shit out of me. And I'd always <laughs> be so relieved when he'd come back. And my mother didn't ever do anything athletic like that. So right, right. I never experienced her doing that. But it was... Very emotional, it sounded like. Yeah, it was like intimations of mortality in early childhood. I think that all, all people, all children, probably even infants, you know, if their mother walks out of the room, they're abandoned. So You'll appreciate it because when I go down to the beach, like Sag Main Beach, I used to go with my friend Christian Wolfer. He'd go late in the day and he'd go jump into the ocean and I'd be, and he'd go out far, even if it was tumultuous and waves. Mm -hmm. And I'd always sit there like in trepidation and then, of course, we lost Christian Wolfer to the water, you know, in the water. That was so yeah, was very sad Oh, it's so awful. So, so terrible. So the water, and you often have water in your paintings, it can bring up all kinds of emotions, you know, the sea. And that one that you showed us in, in the back room at the gallery, that you feel like you're almost in the wave. Yeah, I, I, I love, I, I love you it. know, there's a lot of calm in my paintings. There's a lot of, like, held down calm and <laughs> that that painting is one of a bunch of paintings I've done now I mean like not tons but there's a lot of ocean paintings that I've done I'm fascinated by turbulence I'm fascinated yeah. by I love chaos theory and all those ideas of there being like a kind of a amassing of movement and behavior that results in order moments of order and the ex that you can see the ocean's turbulence occurring at when you're down at the shore is really fascinating to me. And that, that painting involved an awful lot of changes to what the photographic references that I was using were showing and then my original printout that I was painting from when I began. But the specific ocean area or waterway in the Hamptons, or is that part imagination? It was mostly one photograph, but I ended up making a lot of changes on it on the computer. And then when I painted it, many, many more. And that's kind of normal for me, mm -hmm. like that I would have something that I'm kind of riffing on. And then as I'm painting, the thing starts to take shape. And then I think I like to emphasize that a lot of the decisions that I make when I'm painting are not based on, is this enough like what it looked like? Because nice. that's not really where I'm going with it. It's more about, is this water pressing down and showing enough weight that, that the waves that are occurring on top of it are held by it? Is it, is it like, you know, like sleeping under a heavy blanket or something? Like I, I wanted there to be a certain kind of depth felt by looking at the surface of the water mm -hmm. conveyed by a certain kind of weighty, weightiness. And the original compared to the water behind you right now. <laughs> that's just kind of that's kind of a sheerness. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, I've painted 
I was doing two ocean paintings in the 90s, late 90s, kind of consecutively when I first got on this kick about like how to paint the ocean and how much detail to include or eliminate. And in one of the paintings, I kind of unconsciously made the water much more turbulent as I was painting it. It was really kind of flat and sheer out to the horizon. And the more I painted it, the more turbulent it got. And I just thought, well, all right, okay, this is this painting. And it just sort of did that itself, I felt. And then the next painting um, was actually a much more turbulent looking from a much more turbulent like collage of a couple of photographs. And I remember thinking, I know how to do this because I just did it on the previous painting. And then it turned out being like I, I kind of did it. I started to do it like that. And then I was like, no, because the the massing of the clouds above it and the way that the light was penetrating the space, I needed something that was really sheer right. so that that could all take place above it, like uh, like something going up in the air and exploding or something. So I ended up repainting it and holding it down and making it really flat. And it was they were both surprises but in completely different ways. It was, you know, there's all these object lessons, I think, if you paint, do something long enough like your work has these little stories i mean i remember when you were at the newberger museum of art yeah yes. uh, that was a yeah. wonderful wonderful experience that That's was a wonderful. that was a mid-career retrospective they exactly. called it <laughs> mid-career it's like when they say mid-career artists i'm always like is that an age thing? Is that how much experience you've had? Is that how much? I think that's many- an age thing. <laughs> As like saying, okay. instead of saying middle-aged artist. Yeah. Right. I love looking to see that you are two biennials. I mean, you know, that's pretty remarkable. If you were Guildhall, Parish, and then museums from all over, I guess, because you're from Ohio, do you have a proclivity for showing to museums or anywhere from? I, I've uh, never had anything at the Cleveland Museum of Art, which well, you I haven't. Little, okay, then it was maybe I feel a little time. insulted by it, but yeah, that, I'm I, sorry I to bring leave. it up. <laughs> I did leave. I stomped out of there and went to, you know, first Nova Scotia and then New York. Been in Nova Scotia at the museum there, right? Yes, actually, because my that was a big surprise because the Newberger Show traveled there to the Art Gallery of Nova Scotia, which is their big museum, and yes. it was very nice. It was, it was nice going back, and it was fun going back. And people had, for years, because it was the place where I started to realize that conceptual art wasn't doing it for me. Partly in conversation with my professor that was kind of guiding me into right. my. BFA. I never got an M. He was struggling with a certain kind of conceptual bent in his work, and we would have these long conversations about where we were going, and I realized I was kind of trying to illustrate structuralist writers' texts Mm -hmm. with my work, but I was making them as poetic (laughs) as possible. And it was like poetry in motion. (laughs) Yeah. But I was like, you know, at some point I was like, I've got to surrender to this person that I actually am, which is Mm -hmm. even though I, I do, I love to think about, I read science books and I read all the time and I'm, I'm concerned about politics, but (laughs) fundamentally like past that. And more than that, there's this kind of vulnerable spirituality that I think is just trying to get out there. I think it's interesting because you also can, had these conversations with the um, man in your life who has been in your life for a while, of course. Um, some of us know who he is. <laughs> a little while, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it seems like there's almost, you're, you have very different artwork, thank God. There's no competition when it comes to your art. You and Eric Fischel, to me, are a great team that started at a very early, when you first met, I am sure there was a special connection. And then to see not just your art is very different, but do you converse with him about your work? Do you comment? Do you mind criticisms from one another? I love to look at art and think about it. And I have a sort of a, a sort of a fast eye, if you will. Like when I go in and I look at something, I can kind of figure out like, like if I'm looking at a student's work, I can always tell like when they got a little bored and they filled in, or they did something a little gratuitously, or they lost interest, Mm -hmm. or hierarchically, that's just not their priority. And so they did something in a kind of a lazy way, but really good art can't be made that way. You can't 
-hmm. you can have a hierarchical attitude and make a painting or a drawing or a you know installation or whatever. So you're a harsh critic. <laughs> I am a harsh critic, actually, but I'm not. I'm I'm a harsh critic, but I'm not an asshole. So I would never go into. I didn't say that, by the way. <laughs> no, I did, but I don't. I think I think everybody can take that word. But I would never go into a student's studio and say, you're no good or this painting sucks. I always try to get around it and find out what their intention was and explain why something doesn't work for me. Right. And I never like to say, you should do more like this. I hate that. I, yeah. I just think it's really important for people to find their own way and no person, like no matter how smart they are or well-intentioned, is going to really know what someone else should do. There's a million different ways to to for a person to move into their their work and their life's work and their careers as a career, sort of a weird word. But I know, but it's so much more vocation vocational. I think sure. when you're making art, anyway. Well, I know a lot of artists that try to make a living off of their work, so I call it it's their career artists versus doing yeah. it for fun. Well, duh. Right. Yeah, if, if you're lucky, yeah, you if can you're be. Lucky. And but by Eric, the way, I, I bring up Eric and you and maybe the way you might interact as a husband and wife and when you look at each other's work, because when I walk through the exhibit this summer at Parrish with Eric and I saw your work, I was wondering, I wonder what April thought when he finished that beautiful work of her. I, you're in a in a room and it's... Oh, right. Paris, I think, perhaps. April in Paris. That's, April I think that's Paris. what it's called. It, it was my name namesake song. Because my right. parents were like struggling with names, Christine or Diane, and my dad was a jazz trombonist. Oh right, your father's a musician, right? So they both liked the song "April in Paris." So somehow they they made the the creative leap to that name, which I was horrified at as a as a as That's a little right. girl. You know, right. I thought this name is too weird. Nobody is named that. Everybody's named Mary Jo or. Um, but the painting itself is it's very vulnerable, and it's also very very real there's a real rea realness to it and i thought i wonder how april first reacted i mean obviously you sat for the painting he had just taken a photograph of me oh, okay. in the hotel that we were at and worked from that and when i saw the painting i thought legit yeah. i mean really was was oh good i don't look like i'm trying to hold myself together in some way i looked i looked to me like normal and relaxed yeah like um, you just got out of bed <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like I hadn't quite. Some people have said that it looks vulnerable, and some people like I look ferocious in it, which surprised me. This walkthrough, I I know you weren't there, but it was interesting to hear people's perspective on the viewer's eye of a portrait, and just to see in me when I looked at you, I saw this wonderful connection between a man and a woman. I showed what I saw because I thought there oh, was that's this nice. I saw this bond. So that's that was my first reaction and but I felt like I was sort of intruding. I felt like an intruder also. It's sort of interesting. Well, I mean it's it's it is me naked, like way naked. Yeah. So I, when he said like they're going to put that painting in the show, I was like, "Oh, cuz I've never had <laughs> why. even when that? it was up in New York and the first show in which it was exhibited, I didn't know so many people that would see it so but yeah you know it's like yeah you got one body and that's what it is and yeah. oh well who cares you know no, you have a beautiful you know it's a beautiful piece of work the idea was that artists would would pick would choose art from their collection and then they would add their own work to it in response to it so eric had chosen all portraits of yes. women that look like oh that, i that see showed so, intelligence right. and awareness and weren't just like something to work with as a model. But right. he like so their it's own Eric co and their collection combined. Yeah, so it was Eric's choices from his work what? that he had, and then, yeah, that, so. Well, I'm um, glad he didn't sell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, actually that, you know, if you really want to know the truth. Yes, Steve, we do. Steve Martin bought that painting and oh, owned wow. it. He's a friend of ours, and yes. he, he owned it for quite a while, and then he and Eric traded back for it so okay. i had nothing to do with it i was so what did eric get when he traded when he got you back what did eric give <laughs> i can't quite remember. remember 
No worries. I can't quite remember. I have to ask him. How has your work changed over 40 years? The way that I paint has changed. I had a much more kind of what I would call a mark making approach to it. I thought of painting. I sort of had to teach myself to paint because when I was in school, I was doing like hard edge abstractions and things like that. And then I tried to move into conceptual art because that was so the right thing to do then and painting was dead. And then when I secretly started painting landscapes after I'd been in Nova Scotia, after I'd gotten my BFA and didn't go to art school, although I did get accepted, but then I, I don't know, had this feeling like don't go back to school too influenced or too easily influenced. So it was much better for me to just be working by myself. And then as I needed to paint, cause I decided at some point without realizing it, that I wanted to paint light. I got really excited about light. Why? I heard. And then I made up this, this one work, and then I made more works, and then I had all these dreams, and I tried to paint for my dreams. And the way that I would paint was very kind of shy and tentative and had to do with, I thought, well, what's, what's painting? Painting is like many, many marks that add up to something that looks like something. So I was almost rendering that in a literal way. And then I became much more interested in, in detail and as I've described it, you know, my kind of balances of weight and weightlessness, gravity, complexity. And I remember seeing a guy, there was a guy named Joe Santori that showed at Edward Thorpe Gallery when I showed there, and he had these beautiful drawings of clouds, kind of like, not the same as, but a little bit in the spirit of Leonardo's clouds as turbulence drawings, you know how he did the yes. clouds yeah. and then the water. And, yeah. and I started to think, oh, maybe detail has a, has a function. Maybe there's something about it. And I started to think about it as a way of accumulating intensity, accumulating tension, releasing tension, like all the things that you could do. So I was kind of seeing adding more detail as from a, a drawing perspective in a way. So this sort of bones of a thing would, would need fleshing out in a certain way in order to like have greater complexity. And that's how I ended up making the paintings. I mean, in a way kind of more realistic, but I was thinking mm -hmm. of it more in terms of a benefit that would allow me to have more tools to work with. I haven't talked about this that much recently, but there was a point in the early nineties where I was working very unhappily in my studio. I just could not, one summer I just couldn't, I was working on one painting, I couldn't get it done. And I realized I was really depressed and my work was not helping me in the same way. I was like losing touch with it somehow. And that's when I started making small paintings. I remember like doing talks, you know, if I'm invited to give a talk and sometimes at a school and you would give a talk and then you give critiques to the students and da, da, da. But I remember one time several years after that, that I kind of blurted out to the audience that I've been through this fairly long, you know, a couple of years period of depression where I was having a lot of trouble finding myself again and that I worked myself out of it basically by referring back to uh, Memories, Dreams, Reflections, a book by Carl Jung when he talks about going down to a stream outside his house as an old man and making himself play with pebbles and sticks and things like that. He just made himself play. Right. And I thought, that's what I've lost. I've lost the spirit right. of play in my studio. This is terrible. I've got to get it back. It just, I just kind of like resourced it out of my own head. And so I thought I don't want to make drawings because I was dr making drawings because I didn't want to stop working. Is that when I, you were doing the charcoals or is that another? That's when like I started that. doing more charcoals. And, I, thought, yeah. I actually had started doing charcoal drawings in about 1980, I think four or something. And I really like them, but I turned to them then because I couldn't quite make paintings work for me. And I felt like I was making the art that I make. Mm -hmm. I felt like I was making, I was imitating my own work in some way. So 
I thought, I know what I'll do. I'll just make little paintings. And then if I goof it up, you know, they won't take me like a month right. or a month and a half like paintings used to. Now they take me three months. So that sort of didn't fix that, but it just kind of freed me up. And then the little paintings became like the two behind me right now. They the one, making the one, the one that's, that's not charcoal. That's a painting. The, the this is a one. painting. Okay. This is a painting and it's, from maybe 15 years ago or so. Oh, wow. And I, I just liked it, so I kept it. And then this is this is one, it's a little bit bleachy. I've been putting medium on it and drawn the colors back up, but that's really new. Recent. Yeah, very recent. Oh, great. The last thing that I did. But so making- well, the, You had a beautiful one at Tripoli Gallery. There was an, a, a women's exhibition he did this summer. One yeah. Of the, I don't know what period that was, but I don't know if that was your '90s piece or not. But I remember the green, the green and blue landscape. No, there's the big green one? And blue, but there was also a, a charcoal or black. Um, yeah. that one was that yeah. a '90s piece. No, that's a recent one. That's recent. That, okay. It's crazy reflection one. Yeah, oh, yeah. I got I got into this crazy reflection thing. That that's like recent, like maybe five years ago or something. Okay. It's a long conversation and yes. sometimes I need to revisit subject matters or I, I, I start thinking about something triggers a remembrance of a, of a painting and I start kind of going back to that place and thinking like what happened since then? Where am I now if I were to work with that kind of mood or whatever? Like I miss it. Sometimes I just miss places. I want to go back to that you know, literal plays. I love the idea, by the way, that you had music at your exhibition in the city, because I know a lot of artists like to listen to music. I don't know if you listen to music and what you listen to, but I, I love that at the century. church, you're going to be having this event coming up where a piece is being, or a piece was composed or being composed yes. with was your work, composed. was mm -hmm. composed by, um, was it uh, Niles Luther, um, I believe? Yes. He's a wonderful young contemporary classical composer and Deborah Ayers, who is the head of Montage Music Society, which specifically seeks to make interdisciplinary connections between, say, musicians and painters or whoever, and commissions work, which is always helpful to young yes. creatives, had asked us to possibly take a look at joining forces, working together, collaborating. I right. didn't know how to do that, and neither did he exactly. But then I had just started the painting Light Bending the World, yes. and I hadn't just started it. It was about two-thirds of the way, two-thirds to three-quarters of the way done. And he came out to my studio here two summers ago and spent quite a long time like kind of working it out. said something to me about, being interested in showing my work. And I went and looked at his roster. I was like, yes. I mean, it's, it's great that he has such, and I don't think he thinks in terms no. of that. I think it's just his sensibility, yeah. but he very generously rented a piano. Said it. I mean, he, he yes. did a lot to make that concert happen and it was beautiful music. I had not heard it completely. So it was a serious thrill for me. At I was the church on tired. October 26th. By the time the audience yeah. will hear it, unfortunately, you'll probably already have happened. But I know you're doing a, a, a concert. Speaking of yeah. the church, I just want to touch on these two spots that are incredible in Sag Harbor. The church deconsecrated 19th yes. century Methodist yep. church. And you, well, you're not Methodist, <laughs> but you're no, a nice, you fact, went to church. In fact, when we heard that the church had been deconsecrated and that the Methodists were selling it, I was like, being a Catholic, I was like, you can do that. You can like just deconsecrate a church and then yeah. it's no longer this sanctified right. thing. Right. So I was quite shocked. People for years, it was, it was fallow for, oh my God, like 12, 15 years before we ended up purchasing it. And it had three previous owners before we got it. Right. The Sag Harbor partnership that- Not at all. Oh. The church is me and Eric. Oh, just wow us like we decided to you do decide. it and okay yeah we we have formed our own not for profit called edge and center that's the name of the the not for profit the technical name for the not for profit Wonderful. because the church was very much taken yes. as a website as a right. you know a name for a 501c3 
he was particularly engaged in the idea of making as a give back an artist residency someplace out here on the East End. You know, I'd heard everybody say, wow, that Methodist church should be a community center, whatever that is. And so I was, Which it is. Because I have, yeah, because I've done a lot of, you know, stuff like the Sag Harbor Cinema by and build the chairperson of that. There is a real community out here. People really do know each other. It really yes. is a village. And there's, there's this fantastic kind of interaction that's always taking place with people. We have amazing programming because we have art. We do have art exhibitions, particularly in the summer. There's a big one right now. There's a bicycle show, the history of the bicycle and the history, a mini history of the bicycle and photography. That's yes, like I met uh, Peter Lubell, who uh, was with ICP at one point. Who Yeah, and Jennifer. Was- they curated the photography portion. Yes. And Eric and the guy from the Bicycle Museum of America curated the bike. Bremen, um, Ohio, is it? New Bremen. is. It's a fascinating thing. A guy named Jim Dickey, who is a major art collector and wonderful yes. person, has this company that he built into like a bazillion-dollar uh, enterprise and he makes forklifts and yes. you know big machinery. He actually made a company town out of New Bremen, which was more like a location than a finished place. He put a wonderful cinema in it and he put the bicycle museum there. He collected bikes and did this amazing museum. And I love the had- show, by the way. It's fabulous. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we're very happy with it. Well, Jim was very generous in helping us to like access great bikes. We had several people at the opening say, this is the best show you ever had. No, the boxing show right before was quite amazing too. I know. I would not, don't make me pick. I would not <laughs> this because I've loved what's been and happening. And I love what you're doing there. You, you have like Knowledge Fridays and Insight Sundays. I know yeah. my friend Lois Nesbitt's doing a little yoga, but talk. This Coming week, right up. I love the John Steinbeck, um, where you had the performance of his book. Um, oh, yeah. That was Winter of Our Discontent. Now, that was a benefit that we held at, sure. the church at a very low rate to assist with raising money for the John Steinbeck house, because yeah. John Steinbeck, I don't know how many of your audience would know, he lived here in the last 15, 20 years of his life. He wrote Winter of Our Discontent and Travels with Charlie, two of his very well-known books. His dog, here. Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> and Winner of Our Discontent was was the book that was kind of cited when he won the Nobel, and he'd, he'd written that whole thing, yes. not only in Sag Harbor, but kind of about Sag Harbor. There are many thinly disguised characters that right. some of the older people here will tell you, like, that's definitely so-and-so. Raising of the funds to preserve yes. the John Steinbeck house. And that's also, that yes. is part of the Sag Harbor Partnership, I believe. Yes? That um, was the Sag Harbor Partnership Project. I brought the partnership into that, but it was um, particularly Susan Mead and Diana Howard, two of our president and board member, um, respectively, who did an enormous amount of work on that, making a liaison with University of Texas, Austin, who have the Missioner Center, which is the most renowned writer's residency program in the world. Turned out that there were all these crazy connections. Elaine Steinbeck is from Austin, Steinbeck's last late wife. And Diana knew people, Diana Howard knew people from there. So we, it was a very complicated endeavor. And we were incredibly grateful to the town of Southampton for giving us most of the funds needed to actually purchase the house. It was a long negotiation. Well, I With remember when you had like $75,000 more to go, and I think it cost like millions to buy. The town couldn't pay for the whole thing. so And we had substantial help from a lot of the neighbors, actually, who lived there who didn't want to see it turn into a McMansion right. any more than we did. They also appreciated that it was of historic importance. And now we have this wonderful young writer, the first real long-term writer in residence and she's she's killing it and she has a connection to Steinbeck too it's just it's all it's beautiful well, it's like I met her there was a little dinner after the the show or the play the reading I should say and I got yeah. to meet the first writer residence writer because I had just yeah. been on a tour with the woman who owns or one of the owners of the Caneo bookstore and so yes. yes who actually it was Catherine who really started the whole yes. effort to Hats off to Steinbeck's house because she saw that it was up for sale, knew its history intimately, got 
I don't know how many tens of thousands of people to sign a petition letter to try to save it. She needed the organizational help that we were able to provide. So, and then fundraising and stuff, but it was, She's it a was wonderful a, tour guide, was, all I can tell you. She took us oh, through the house. She is such a beautiful soul. She feels everything very deeply. She's very politically committed. And her, she and her wife, Marianne um, Calendrill, actually own Canio's bookstore. Yes. And they have preserved it in the most magnificent way. Cinema, just one we have to touch on it. So I love that you have these themes and you have a wonderful blog. You have mm-hmm. all these events that you do around the theater. I, I know your benefit was like sold out like that. Yeah. I mean, you, it's amazing what you've done there. There was a group of us that got together in 2009 and made the cinema project and went to the owner of the cinema and begged for him to sell it to us so we could save it as a not-for-profit cinema and keep it going in the way that it had showing art movies and, you know, like all sorts of interesting stuff. He was not interested. Fast forward to the summer of 2016, we did a big benefit on the wharf for raising money for Steinbeck Park. Different from the Steinbeck House, but the park that the village was trying to... It had Windmill is. Yeah, it had gotten some preserved land and they wanted to they wanted to turn it into a park. So we did a party for that. It was meant to be like very barefoot and affordable for all. So it was $50 ticket price. Jerry and Francoise Mallow came to that benefit and it blew their minds that there was like everybody there. Uh-huh. And so they came to me the following week and they said, we've decided that we want to preserve the Sag Harbor Cinema as a not-for-profit, and we think that you should do this, and you know, and like with the partnership. And I was like, oh, my God, yes, we will. And <laughs> then I told them about it. That was in July 2016. We were almost ready to sign the contract with them for the sale yes. of the cinema. It was scheduled for about the 28th of December. On December 16th, the cinema burned down. And so Unbelievable. everything went like, completely haywire. Jerry, the owner, who was an old real estate developer, you know, like saw an opportunity to to do something a little more profitable. And it was a lot of negotiations, but he did finally sell it to us for what, for the, the price that we had originally agreed upon. And then we had to raise the money and then we had to raise the money for construction. And when I say we, I mean, really we, I was the chairman none of the chairperson of the thing, but it was like so many hands doing so much work. Interestingly, from the original Sag Harbor Cinema project in 2009, a woman named Julia Daniolo Villan, who I didn't even realize at the time how important she is, but she programs American films for the Venice Film Festival. She still does. And she became our artistic director for the cinema. So when we said to her, we want something that shows great art movies and great unusual, you know, offerings. And we know that you know all of these people and how to do that. But we also want to be able to show first-run films so that the people who didn't go to the Sag Harbor Cinema for many, many years because they showed mostly art films and French and foreign films will come back and enjoy the theater. And she has just executed the most brilliant, brilliant, brilliant programming there. So we're very lucky. And that's where we are now. Every time I'm out there, I, I, I would go online and I go right away. And I love the gentleman you have sitting at the you know desk there. He's so wonderful. Joe. Joe. Yeah. Everyone Joe's great. Joe. You know, we have Joe. like, we have all these incredibly <laughs> cool local people that yes. everybody loves. There's yes, a lot exactly. of love going on. Yeah. And you have, you know, you, I look up, I'm like, okay, they have Taylor Swift already, the Eras Tour, mm-hmm. and then they have the years of 100 years of Warner Brothers. We have a preservation event every year in right. November. Yes. It's about film so, preservation, and it's partly um, supported by Scorsese, Scorsese, who gave us who gave us a lovely quote about how important it was to preserve the cinema and just learned so much from going to the cinema about film, the history of film, yes. the lack of preservation. For instance, did you know that Gene Hackman, like The Conversation, yes. The Conversation is one of the greatest movies ever made. Unbelievable. Clearly, they were down to like one original reel that was wow. in danger of like disappearing forever. 
People don't understand like how much is needed for film preservation. Absolutely. So I want to go out to the Hamptons. I love the city. I mean, I'm a city girl. I'm a real <laughs> native New Yorker born and bred. But I go out there and I, I, there's not enough time to do all the things between the church, the Sag Harbor Cinema, all the mm. art openings, all the galleries in Sag Harbor, great restaurants. Oh, I mean, it's such a great Street Theater. Bay Street, Street Theater. theater. And then more in the summer, but the Whaling Museum has some Whaling great, Museum, fantastic, so it's such terrific. a wacky, fantastic museum. Yes, and the yes. library is a beautiful place to visit. I mean, library, we have a ton Jermaine, of cultural John thing. Jermaine, yes. Yeah, and, it's so, yeah, And I love that you are doing all of these wonderful strategic partnerships like you just did with the John Germain Library coming to New York and doing a little excursion with people and going to the Whitney Museum and being in support of other art institutions. That's part of our self-imposed mandate is to make sure that we're being collaborative and not just not just trying to blow everybody out of the water or something right. like we Well, you've also partners. exhibited your work at the Southampton Art you, you've been at all, all the different or I'm not sure if you've been at Southampton Art Center yet, but I know you know of course Christina Mercedes Strassfield who yeah. we just interviewed and you know of course Alice Acock because she has a sculpture right outside the church and we interviewed her for inside the show. Oh my god. Her sculpture outside the church is one of people's favorite things. It's one of her whirlwinds. So I guess it's on loan. <laughs> Um, it is, no. and I wish. Oh gosh, I wish we could buy it. I mean, we are a not for profit, so we yeah. have to be. be you careful. know, we have to act like a not for profit because we are, and it's very important. Well, that's that why we, we need more people to join and support yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> Get your membership now. Get your membership now. Go to the church, the church Harbor dot org, and the Sag Harbor Cinemas is just the Sag Harbor Cinema dot yeah. org. Well, yeah. we'll we'll, we'll put that up on the podcast. And thank you, thank you, thank you for being this trailblazing, innovating, rule-breaking woman. And oh, thank you. Thank you for you doing all the goodness that you do in the world and keep it up the good work. I also remember you, by the way, going to your home years ago for the Evelyn Alexander Wildlife Rescue Center. Rescue Center. Yeah. I know you care very much about animals and nature. I, I don't think I specifically said that. Yes. A lot. Yeah. And and, and I, I actually had um, tried with a friend of mine to get the no-kill shark tournaments changed into catch-and-release shark tagging tournaments instead in Montauk. That was years ago. But, yeah, I mean, if I had more bandwidth and more clout, I would definitely like to do more work on um, preserving the animals that live out here. But people can do a lot in their own backyards. Yes. Don't use nitrogen and don't let runoff get into the into our bays and waterways. And yes. I could go on. I Thank won't. <laughs> well, 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 I know the Longhouse, we didn't mention them, but Longhouse is doing that now. After Jack Leonard Larson passed and Carrie took over, I know they're going more about indigenous plants and trees and not using fertilizer like they used to use quite a bit and spend a lot of money on that. Yeah, yeah. I think everybody's got getting the message on this. If It's just like, can we do it fast enough to not exterminate ourselves with our own technological pride. <laughs> Our advancement. So much for advancement, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Let me just say back at you. Thank you for being an innovative, trailblazing podcaster. And Thank I you. love the idea of the She Cave, too. Yes. Well, you're welcome to join us anytime in the She Cave. It's always a pleasure. Please subscribe to Inside the She Cave, Trailblazers, Innovators, Role Breakers, wherever you listen to podcasts, including but not limited to Spotify, Amazon, and Apple Podcasts. If you prefer to watch, you can visit us on YouTube.